1 John. And so because of that, I'm going to do like a little bit of intro into the book of 1 John. John was written by the Apostle John. Most all scholars are pretty agreeant on this because of the consistency between the two writing styles of the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And um, he was one of the sons of thunder, those being James and John. They were brothers, and they were known for strong opinions and strong, spontaneous impulses. Do any of you know some guys who are like that? Yeah, maybe, maybe you've got a friend who like wakes up at three in the morning and is like, yeah, let's go jump off a cliff. Or, I don't know, that was a really bad example. <laughs> but that was the first thing that came to my mind. Oh no, okay. <clears throat> Anyways, their spontaneous nature is demonstrated um, at a time in Luke chapter 9, um, which I'll read in a little bit here. Jesus and apostles are traveling from town to town in a region, and they come upon a Samaritan town. And just a little bit of historical context with that. Um, the Samaritans, there was like a really um, basically intense controversy between Jews and Samaritans. Because Samaritans, when Israel was still a kingdom, they were a faction of the Jews that decided to separate and go separate from the covenant of God and indulge in pagan practices. And they pretty much like embraced that pagan lifestyle. And so to an Orthodox Jew, a Samaritan is just awful person. Yes, and so all little Jews are raised to believe that Samaritans are just terrible people, and you should never, ever associate with a Samaritan. So Jesus and his disciples come to this Samaritan town, and what happens is actually pretty interesting. It says, when the days drew near for him, being Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, which this essentially means like he is starting his path towards Jerusalem, which means he is starting his path towards the cross. He's starting his path towards his death. So it says, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> but Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. I love how, like, his rebuke is just, like, so, like, succinct and short. It's like Jesus basically, like, looks back at them and is like, are you idiots? Never mind. Okay, let's just keep going. Like, <laughs> seriously, I've been teaching you this whole time to love people, and now you're asking me if you want me to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Like, oh my gosh. But from the story, you can kind of see like James and John were very much like gung-ho. Like they were very passionate. And whenever they got behind a cause, it was definitely like they were all in. And they devoted themselves to that. So at the time of the writing of First John, John is actually addressing uh, false prophets. There had been a period in the churches that he was supervising that some false prophets had come in and kind of shaken the ground in the churches. And the people were not really sure who to believe and what to believe. And John is coming in and just saying, all right, like, this is what we believe. And anything outside of this, no. Okay, so he's kind of coming in and setting the groundwork. Um, Benefit of that is now today, like several, several hundred years removed from that, now we know like this is, this is what the church was founded on. This is what we believe as a community, as we fellowship together, this is what we, we believe. So that is the benefit of 1 John. So our text that we're going to be in today that we're actually going to be in today is in 1 John, starting in chapter 1 with verse 1. And this first section of scripture 
in 1 John is John basically establishing like, okay, like we've had these false prophets, but what do we believe? And he starts off establishing that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is really what this is all about. And something I also want you to keep in mind is like John walked alongside Jesus in his ministry. And probably a lot of these people in the churches he's addressing have also seen Jesus' ministry and had been witness to his miracles. So as we're reading through the text, I just want you to like keep your mind out for little verbal cues where John is like, you know, like you saw Jesus, you know Jesus. So verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So already John is like, you have seen it. Like we've touched it. We have seen the miracles. It says the life was made manifest, and we have seen it once again. And testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life that was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So John is establishing the groundwork, like we have seen Jesus, we know that we believe his miracles, we know that, we, that he came to earth, that he was made manifest, that he died on the cross, and it is because of him that we have this wonderful fellowship of believers, and it is because of him that we have this wonderful fellowship with God as well. So this is John setting the stage for this address that he is making to the church. The next section of scripture that we're going to go over is John very much drawing the line. I mean, it's basically like, okay, guys, this is how it is. Draw us the line. Like, you're on that side, then sorry, you're in the darkness. You're on this side, all right. Like, you're in the light. You're with, you're with us. You're with the fellowship of believers. So, <clears throat> um, we'll just go ahead and start reading verse 5. Chapter 1, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So this is a thought that I really want you guys to take capture of, because it's a really, really cool, um, a cool mental image, and a really cool way of explaining, like, the character of God. Because God is light, I mean, his very essence is light. His very character is light. And in him, there is no darkness, none whatsoever, because he is light. And it's really cool because it also kind of creates this word picture of, like, you know, um, one of the things that really fascinated me when I was going through um, physical science in high school was explaining how really there's no actual such thing as darkness. It's just the absence of light. And it's the same thing with heat and cold. There's no really such thing as cold. It's just the absence of heat. And so with this, with this mental picture, John is saying, like, the, the darkness... The darkness that I'm speaking of is the absence of God because God is light. And so in that, I mean, we could even say like this, think of good and evil. Like it says elsewhere in the Bible, God is good. His very character is good. So what is evil? I mean, evil is the absence of good, the absence of God. That's pretty cool when you think about it. Because God gave us this choice of whether we want to include him in our lives or whether we want to step away from him, whether we want to separate from him. Because he's not going to force himself into your life. He is going to wait for you to make that decision to invite him into your life. So you have the power over that. Um, so in verse... Let's see. We'll just continue reading in verse 2. It says, He is the propiti... Oh, wait. Never mind. I skipped ahead. Verse 6. <laughs> I forgot that I had only read verse 5 and not 
continued into verse 6, but I really love that verse. If we say we have fellowship in him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice this truth. This is where John is like, okay, draw the line. All right? So if you say that you walk in the light, yet you still participate in darkness, you are not truly in the light. I mean, he blatantly calls you a liar if you say you walk in the light, yet have darkness. Because it's, it's true. I mean, just think about the, the light and the dark that we've been talking about. Okay, you walk into a dark room and you have a flashlight. And you turn on the flashlight. The darkness has no choice but to flee because the light has come in. And so think of, think of your life. Like when you invite God in, when you truly invite him into every corner of your life, the darkness has no choice but to flee. And yeah, yeah, we can keep corners and we can be like, well, God, like, I don't really want your light over here. But in order to truly be with God and to truly walk in the light, we must surrender our dark corners because we, not, we cannot truly be in the light until we let it permeate every area of our lives. So this is also a little bit difficult because I talked about the dark corners. And sometimes when we're inviting the light into our lives and we're thinking about like, like, okay, God is light and I do have darkness in my life. But when the light comes, it kind of hurts sometimes. Have you ever gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're like, okay, like can I mentally map out the way to the toilet? And then you're like, oh, I don't remember if I left my backpack here or there. And you come to the, the sad realization that you actually do need to turn on the light. Otherwise, you're going to like be stubbing your toes and running into doors. And yeah, so you flip on the light and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. Well, that's how it is sometimes when you have these dark corners and you're like, okay, like I'm, I'm going to let the light in. It'll hurt a little bit. But your eyes will adjust, and you'll get used to it. And in the end, you'll be able to avoid stubbing your toes, and you'll be able to move these things out of your way, and you'll eventually be able to get to the toilet and go to the bathroom. But, I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, the light may hurt, but it is so worth it for the freedom to not stub your toes. A, maybe a, a different mental picture as well is like, maybe we don't really want to turn on the light because we don't really want to see what's there. So back in my dorm room, when I used to live in the dorms, I, my room was lit by like this one middle fluorescent bulb in the room. It was awful. And I hated it because it was like this, this harsh, bright light. And I would always light my room with Christmas lights because it was like kind of dim and you couldn't really see everything. And I mean, you could kind of fudge it on room checks. Like maybe I didn't vacuum this week. Like the RA won't be able to tell because like it's a little bit dimmer. And it's, I mean, it's cozy. <laughs> So, but you know what? Like, we can't fudge it. We can't fudge it with God. We can't be like, okay, God, like, come in a little, like, but, like, tone it down, you know? <laughs> Could you, like, go to, like, the brightness level of Christmas lights? Like, that'd be nice. <laughs> then I wouldn't have to, like, oh, yeah, there's this pizza box under my bed that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. No, like, God doesn't tone down, God is that fluorescent bulb in the middle of the room that bears everything. But you know what? That's good for us. It's good for us because it makes us address those dark corners. And it, we can't ignore the pizza box under the bed. Or we can't ignore that there's a lot of stuff on the floor. Like, we need that. And God knows it because it gives us freedom from our mess. It gives us freedom from that darkness. So we're going to go ahead and finish this, starting in verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his Son 
cleans us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So I'm pretty sure that we all can agree that we have all sinned. I mean, the Bible even says it like all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's what this passage is saying here. It's saying like, yes, we have all fallen short. And if you say that you haven't fallen short, like, "Ah, we know, don't worry. (sighs) But we have all fallen short, but don't worry. Don't worry. All you have to do is walk in the light. All you have to do is invite God in and he can heal those wounds and he can take care of those dark corners and we can live in freedom from the darkness. We don't have to have that anxiety and fear of like, oh, like what if someone sees this? Or, oh, like I don't really want God in this. Like that, that produces anxiety. That produces fear. That produces guilt. God wants us to be free from that. That leads into the next point. We're going to introduce grace. Okay, because God is a God of grace. And this past passage has been very much like John is drawing the line and he's like, okay, like you're in the light, you're in the light. You're in the darkness, you're in the darkness. There's no like, okay, like, oh, I'm dark. Oh, I'm light. Okay, no, we need to <laughs> dwell in the light. So here, John is introducing grace. We're going to start in chapters two. It says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I want to define this term of the grace of God just a little bit, because I think a lot of times we kind of soften grace. The grace of God is, it's it's a freeing grace. It's a strong grace. Because a lot of times we, we try to think of grace as like, okay, like, you're doing something wrong. It's okay. Like, it's okay. It's fine. And then you just walk away. But God's grace is strong. And God's grace comes in. And he's like, no, I'm not going to let you rest in this darkness. Like, my grace is that. I free you from that darkness. So... Um, darkness, or uh, grace, (laughs) grace is not God tolerating our sin. Grace is God eliminating our sin and freeing us from the darkness. I had that written down because God gave me that little phrase, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, we need to make this stick. Okay, I'm going to read it again. Ready? God, grace is not God tolerating our sin. Grace is God eliminating our sin and freeing us from the darkness. Man, when that came to me, I was like, oh, okay. Like, how many times have I been like, I sinned, but God has grace, and then I stay in that sin? No, that's not the grace of God. No, the grace of God is that I am freed from that sin. So we'll continue reading in verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a law is a large word. Propitiation means a covering. So like picture this, you're standing before the throne of God and it's like you are this messy, dirty individual full of your sin and I'm Jesus is saying, like, no, like, invite me into your life, and I will be a covering for your sin. I will help heal those wounds, and I will be an advocate for you in front of the throne of God. It's a beautiful picture. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments Shout out to Nathaniel's sermon last week. Keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
So we've established so far that God is light and that if we are in darkness, God's grace is that he frees us from that darkness so that we can walk in the light. I feel like we understand this concept. But understanding a concept and letting it transform your life is two completely different things. I mean, you can know that the sky is blue, but does it change your life in any way? You can know that God is good, but does it change your life in any way? So I, want you, I wanted to give you guys um, a couple of really simple steps, simple principles that you can use to help yourself stay in the light. And it's three points, okay? Try to make it easy to remember. Three points. It is prayer, community, and confession. So the first one being prayer. Prayer is such an amazing, amazing tool. Prayer is the ability to come before the Lord and for him to hear us. And it is so powerful. I was just, um, just talking with someone the other day, and they were talking about like how they were having this really difficult time, and they just like had this sobbing on the floor moment, and they're like, okay, God, like I really, really need some relief. Like, I really, really need some peace, all right? And the peace flowed over them. Like, it was, it was so powerful, like this calm, calm that came from these prayers. And this is true. Like, prayer works, guys. And something that you can even do tonight is tonight during the last song, there's going to be people in the back lined up there ready to pray for you, ready to advocate for you. And these people, they believe in the power of prayer and they care for you all. And you can get up during that last song and you can go have them pray for you. You don't even have to tell them what you're struggling with. You can just say, hey, I'm having a rough time. Could you pray for me? And they will. The second point being community. God blessed us with this gift of community for a reason. We were not meant to be lonely islands. We were not meant to be little points of solitude. We were meant to be in community with our fellow believers. We were meant to lift each other up. We were meant to support one another. And guys, on a college campus like this, it can be really easy to get involved in a community that does not support your faith. And I want to be very strong in stating this, is that it is so important, so important for you to be a part of a community that supports your faith. Because without support, I mean, you, you are going to fall. Because God created community for that very reason, to support you. So if tonight is your first time at Catalyst, like, welcome. Man, I am so glad that you are here. And I want to encourage you, like, talk to someone. Like, make a coffee date with someone. Because, like, all these people here, we came here looking for connection, right? We came here looking for a Christian community. And, and get, embrace that. Another opportunity for community that we have coming up, like, super simple. It's our big game party on Sunday. <sighs> yeah. At the men's house. <laughs> It's going to be great. But you know, even, even community events like that, like when you're surrounded by positive influences and you're surrounded by people who are seeking the light, like that can be so beneficial for you. Like, come, come to the party. I'm going to be there. It's going to be great. There's going to be lots of tasty food. And we're going to get to watch the Chiefs hopefully win. Yes, <laughs> go Chiefs. <laughs> but <laughs> community is so important. God made it for a reason. The third part is confession. This is one that everyone's kind of a little bit wary of because confession can be really scary. I mean, confession is like inviting someone or inviting God into these dark places of your life. But I want to tell you that the freedom 
The freedom that comes after confession is so, so worth the temporary pain it takes to confess it. I can attest in my own life, like, confession has given me so much freedom. And just like right here, some resources we have for confession. I mean, we've got, we've got ministers. We've got Shandy. We've got Nicholas. We've got Mariah. We've got Nathaniel. I'm here too. Like, if, if you need to confess something, you can come to us. We won't judge, okay? You want to know why we won't judge? It's because we celebrate when people come seeking freedom from darkness. There's no judgment. It's just joy. Because we see you seeking. And we want to comfort you. And we want to bring you before the throne of God. And we will rejoice with you when you're freed from that darkness. Because that is an awesome feeling once you have that off your chest. Because like we were saying earlier, earlier, like when you hide things in the dark, it creates guilt and anxiety and fear. And when you confess those things, you're freed. You're freed from that guilt and that anxiety and that fear. Because it's the light coming into the darkness and freeing you. So we have covered a lot of ground. Honestly, like, at this point in my sermon, I was just like, oh, man, like, where did I even start? Okay. We started out with establishing that Christ is Lord. And then we went into establishing that God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And there was the whole, like, no such thing as darkness. It's the absence of light, and darkness cannot resist the light, and God is light, and God is good. And then the next, um, the next part of scripture, we looked into biblical grace and how grace, God's grace, is not him tolerating our sin. It is him eliminating it and freeing us. And then we had the three main principles, okay? I really want you guys to remember this because I want to issue a challenge to you guys. Within the next week, I want you to do at least two of them. And that should be fairly easy. But do at least two of them, whether it be prayer, whether it be participating in some sort of Christian community, being able to like create a Christian connection, or confession. And you can let the Spirit lead you in whatever two you need to do. But I want to urge you, if you are feeling the Spirit move in you tonight, act on it. Okay, because friends, we were not called to be passive. We cannot be passive in this life. We must take action because we know the truth in our heads. Now we have to translate it to our hearts. So put these principles into practice. And go to war with the darkness in your life. And come into the freedom that is in the light of God. Because if you love God, you will strive to walk in the light. And I want to invite you tonight to come and be freed from darkness by the grace of God. And come walk in the light. Would you pray with me?